breaking tonight, a change in the quarantine timeline is coming. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, scientists have continued to learn more and more about the coronavirus throughout this pandemic that apparently includes the incubation time. Tonight, the CDC says this potential change in guidelines concerns people who came in close contact with someone who tested positive for the coronavirus. Those guidelines shorten the quarantine time to 10 days after close contact with the infected person or seven days if the person in quarantine receives a negative test result. A 14 day period was initially recommended. The move was presented to the White House COVID task force and the official update to the guideline could come as soon as tonight. Meanwhile, an emergency meeting of the CDC's team of advisors coming together over a COVID-19 vaccine and who should be the first and who will have to wait for it. Their vote on those recommendations were made tonight. In a 13 to 1 vote, they recommended to allow health care providers and those living in long term care facilities to get the vaccine first. A decision that has some here in our area excited for their loved ones. Individual states will still need to make decisions on what recommendations to follow since supply is expected to be limited once a vaccine is given approval. Still, one woman tells the night team's Jaffney Gray this offers a chance to protect the most vulnerable. I haven't seen her since March. Erin Morris is excited after hearing the Advisory Committee of Immunization Practices, or ACIP's, recommendation to give the COVID-19 vaccine to healthcare workers and residents of long-term care facilities first. They need it more than we do. Once it becomes available, her mother, who is in a Seguin long-term care facility with dementia, could potentially be vaccinated. That's why vaccines exist. They exist to protect the most vulnerable. Assistant Director of Metro Health, Dr. Anita Kirian, agrees. During this pandemic, we've seen they are one of the uh, most vulnerable segments of the population at high risk for severe illness, resulting in hospitalizations and deaths. She says each state will take the federal recommendations into consideration, but can accommodate their vaccine distribution plans to fit their needs, especially because the first shipment is expected to be limited. For the state of Texas, Kirian says the initial focus will be for health care workers. They will be able to take the vaccine on a voluntary basis. Mainly the hospital staff working directly uh, with patients who are positive or at high risk for COVID-19. She says long-term care facility residents and others in congregate settings like jails or homeless shelters are also in the critical population category, but not among the first to be vaccinated. Kurian says there are still many things unknown about the vaccine. How long is the immunity going to last with this vaccine? You know, uh, if, if it is given to hospitalized patients, will it reduce the severity of illness? She says she understands the skepticism, but ensures residents the vaccine will be trustworthy. Speed was crucial, but the effectiveness and safety of the vaccines um, have always been matters of paramount importance to researchers. It's, it's important to FDA, and according to FDA, no corners are being cut. Jaffney Gray, KSAT 12 News. Now, Pfizer's vaccine must be held in sub-zero temperatures. Metro Health mentioned University Health is just one hospital equipped with these types of sub-zero freezers and acknowledged rural counties in Texas may face this challenge. The CDC's vaccine advisors are set to meet again after the FDA announces emergency approval, which would likely be next week. Meantime, let's take a look at where we stand with coronavirus cases here at home. The seven day average now dropping to 736 tonight, but still means more than 700 new cases a day are being reported in San Antonio. Today, five new COVID-19 related deaths were reported. And over in our hospitals, 593 COVID-19 patients are hospitalized, an increase of six since yesterday. 188 are in the intensive care unit and 104 are on ventilators. The pandemic also leading to a rise in requests for food. CEO Eric Cooper reminding senior citizens the importance of adequate nutrition and the resources still available to those in need, including home deliveries. The pandemic has increased the need for families who are out of work. 16,000 households receiving help from the San Antonio Food Bank every month. A gentleman shared with me, uh, you know, last week, I, I, I'm worried less about what's underneath the tree. I, I'm worried more about what's going to be on the table for my kids. And if you need assistance, you can call the San Antonio Food Bank's help hotline. That number is 
431-8326. You can also visit their website, safoodbank.org. There are also opportunities to help at the food bank. They are in need of volunteers to help pack boxes, make meals, and deliver food. And a reminder, KSAT teaming up with Trinity University to prepare for several live streams to tackle the different ways coronavirus has changed our lives and where we go from here. KSAT keep teaming up with Trinity for this series. Tomorrow's conversation begins at 6.30 p.m. right here on KSAT 12 and online. It's dealing with how we've all been impacted by the coronavirus. That discussion will continue online only at 7 p.m. One victim believed to be targeted twice, first in a home invasion and then a robbery in San Marcos. And now the suspects are believed to be here in the San Antonio area. San Marcos police say they first responded to a home invasion back on November 17th at the Grove apartment complex. A white Chevrolet Impala with tinted windows was seen leaving with a visible dent in the hood. The same getaway car was seen during a robbery against the same victim just three days later. At that time, police say two men attacked the resident in the parking lot of the same apartment complex, taking the keys to his apartment and the victim's blue Chevy Tahoe. Both the Tahoe and the Impala were seen heading to San Antonio and are believed to be in the area. If you can help in this case, call police. Have you ever heard of jugging? San Antonio police say it's a crime that's on the rise in Central and South Texas, and it's one you need to look out for this holiday season, especially when you go to the bank and the ATM. So what you should consider when you go to those places. We have all the safety tips from law enforcement right now on KSAT.com. One picture leading to a weeks long investigation with a formal letter of discipline in hand. San Antonio's fire chief and the city are moving forward. The photo showed San Antonio Fire Chief Charles Hood kneeling next to a nude woman covered in sushi. While well, the picture was taken back in January at a firefighter's birthday party while Chief Hood was off duty, it only came back to light in October. Today we learned an independent investigation determined Hood violated department rules including conduct and behavior and negative public image. His command staff also found to have failed to forward a complaint about the pictures to human resources in a timely manner. Chief Hood has apologized for this photo and agreed to analyze SAFD's recruitment efforts and develop a mentorship program for female employees who work for the department. When in crisis, many domestic violence victims seek help from their faith leaders, even more so now during the pandemic. Those leaders say they're proud of their members coming forward, but admit they need more tools and networking to properly help survivors. A survivor and two pastors tell the night team's Courtney Friedman how they hope to learn to heal. Beverly Chavez was married for 10 years in an abusive relationship. I didn't want to leave because some of my beliefs and when I reached out to my church, they weren't equipped to tell me how to leave. That fact has become even more clear to local faith leaders during a pandemic that's furthered a domestic violence crisis. The truth is that we're far under-resourced and under-equipped to deal with the severity of domestic violence issues. We have a huge need for tools and connections and network. First Presbyterian Church Associate Pastor Mitchell Moore has already hosted a forum on the subject involving leaders from six sectors. SAPD, mayor's office, uh, health professionals, education, um, nonprofits, churches. And his church isn't the only one taking action. First Baptist Church San Antonio Associate Pastor Danny Panter is helping create a domestic abuse response team within the church. That can understand the nature of abuse, walk alongside and help them to move with all the resources that we're aware of when they're ready to actually act. The idea came while he was working in marriage ministry, seeing flaws in the church's counseling system. Treating these issues as marriage issues when they're abuse issues. He and Pastor Moore plan to evolve in a way that will inevitably save lives. They're participating in a free seminar this Thursday, giving faith-based communities tips and training on domestic violence, and they're praying others join. When we get together as a congregation, instead of having more victims, we're going to have more survivors. Courtney Friedman, KSAT 12 News. The faith-based response to domestic violence virtual seminar is this Thursday, December 3rd, from 11 a.m. to 12.15 p.m. It is free and open to the public. To find out how to join, you can head to our website, ksat.com.
A number of people in Military City USA taking the chance to say goodbye to Chief Warrant Officer 3 Dallas Garza. He was killed in a helicopter crash while on a peacekeeping mission in Egypt earlier this month. Today, a visitation held at Porter Loring Mortuary North on Loop 1604. Tomorrow, a funeral service will be held at Community Bible Church from 1030 in the morning until 1 in the afternoon. That's near 1604 and Gold Canyon. Only 350 people will be allowed to attend and must wear masks and practice social distancing. Well, and you look at our weather pattern, there is some activity off to the north of us. There's some precipitation moving into North Texas. Is it going to head our way? Is it going to be as cold tonight? We'll talk about that and a cold front coming right up. Thank you, Adam. Still ahead on the night beat, a bird's eye view as the new land bridge at Hardburger Park is nearly complete. The new opening day and time coming up. And the head of the Department of Justice responding to the president's claims of voter fraud. What he says the investigation has shown. Next on the night beat. This essay salutes holiday greeting is brought to you by Gomez Law Firm. Hi, my name is Jose Rios. This is my wife Tara and our son Robin. And on behalf of the Gomez Law Firm, we'd like to thank everyone fighting overseas, all first responders, and all the frontline workers. Thank you so much. Merry and Christmas, ha happy Christmas. Happy. Merry Christmas and happy holidays. One of President Donald Trump's allies dealing a blow to the unfounded claims of widespread voter fraud. Attorney General William Barr himself today saying outright the Department of Justice has found no evidence of a compromised election. The president claimed voting machines were manipulated to help pr President elect Joe Biden win. But the head of the Department of Justice countered that claim by saying point blank, quote, we haven't seen anything to substantiate that, end quote. Meanwhile, the transition of power continues this week. President-elect Biden introducing his team that he says will rebuild the economy. One update now on the blood shortage here at home. The South Texas Blood and Tissue Center is just under three days of total blood. But the type O supply is in the critical zone and is in vital need for trauma centers. You are encouraged to donate your blood and donors will be getting a $10 Amazon gift card. Blood will also be tested for COVID-19 antibodies. You can schedule a donation on SouthTexasBlood.org or call the number there on your screen, 210-731-5590. All right, this is something I've been very curious about, and we're going to get a new look now at the land bridge at Hardburger Park. It is now nearing completion. We now have a date and a time when you can use it. The Robert L. B. Tobin Land Bridge set to open to the public next week on December 11th at 1 p.m. Former San Antonio Mayor Phil Hardberger spoke about the different aspects of the bridge in a video that was posted by San Antonio Public Works today. The Skywalk is totally unique as far as I know to any bridge in the United States. The Skywalk starts quite a ways down and ascends so that you're walking through the trees themselves. You're in the trees. While the bridge will help people move across the park, it's also designed to help animals cross safely as well. A feat of engineering. It of is. Sorts. I can't Absolutely. wait to experience it. Yeah. In the meantime, let's take a live look outside with live cam. A little different than the temperatures we saw this time yeah. yesterday, Adam. About 14 yes. degrees yeah. difference. Right. This time yesterday, we were in the upper 30s already here in town. Now, uh-uh, we're still around 50 degrees. Now, earlier this morning, we just have to rewind here. 28 degrees. That was our low temperature at the airport in San Antonio. So we did officially have our first freeze, and it came at exactly the average time, the end of November, early December. But in the hill country, we did dip down into the upper teens briefly in a few spots, including Kerrville, 19. 27 was the low this morning in Pleasanton, Hondo, 26. You don't have to take the necessary precautions for a freeze tonight because temperatures just aren't going to fall off that much. And it's going to be quite a bit warmer tomorrow morning, but near average for this time of year. We missed the record low by two degrees earlier today. All right, take a look at the state. We did have a widespread freeze earlier this morning, and actually there is a weak cold front that's headed our way. That cold front will affect us
tomorrow night and not have an impact on our weather tonight. In turn, temperatures warmer and we're not down to the freezing point. So 50 degrees here, San Antonio and Pleasanton, Hondo as well, 43 Carrizo Springs. And I do think there will be some locations that dip down into the upper 30s for tomorrow morning. I mean, you go west of I-35, right near 40 degrees. So there will be some pockets of upper 30s and even into the hill country, probably some mid 30s. And there could be some nooks and crannies there where you briefly touch the freezing point. But San Antonio, 45 in the morning. Gonzales, Pleasanton, about 46. You look around Bear County, by and large, will be in the mid 40s. Bernie, about 39, though. New Braunfels, 46. The cold front affects us Thursday morning. Okay, so not tonight, not tomorrow morning. But by Thursday, we're getting awfully close to that freezing point. Thursday, Friday, and Saturday, we're expecting low temperatures in the mid 30s. Right now, just a few degrees above freezing. But of course, we'll keep an eye on that and let you know if we have to tweak that forecast at all. So yes, that cold front will be affecting us and we will have uh, more of a chill to the air. One change here, dew points are a little higher. Still very dry air in place, but compared to what we had yesterday, this southeasterly breeze is bumping up those dew point numbers. It's not going to be humid at all, but these numbers will continue to increase, and I do think that's going to saturate our air and give us another round of fog late tonight and early tomorrow morning. Probably just a few hours around sunrise will have this fog, but that should reduce the visibility down to about a mile or so for the morning commute. But that fog is going to be swept away quickly because of that cold front that moves in. Take a look at our future cast in terms of the wind. You're not going to notice it at sunrise, but shortly thereafter, that wind's going to kick in and it's going to be howling around 20 miles per hour and I think some gusts up to 30 throughout the day tomorrow. So you'll notice the breeze, but it's not going to be as cold out there. Looking at the active weather, there's this disturbance coming in from Colorado. It's got some moisture that's going to be pushing into the Texas panhandle. That unfortunately isn't going to make it our way. This is a big, broad upper disturbance that's going to drop into Texas and rain will probably be as close as Lavaca County, maybe even Gonzales area and especially Houston. But around here, we're looking at a sunny day tomorrow. 45 in the morning with that fog, then sunny mid 60s. But that breezy wind north northwest steady at 10 to 20, some gusts at times up to 30 miles per hour. Then we get back into the 30s for the morning readings starting on Thursday, lasting through the weekend. And look at those highs only in the 50s on Thursday and Friday. We'll be back to average by the end of this weekend. Thank you, Adam. All right, the Spurs opened up training camp today and something tells me Greg Popovich was OK with the cameras not being there. Oh, he's very oh, fine with that. Yeah, yes. I think he was okay with that. But at 71, he's the oldest coach in the yeah. NBA, the most tenured coach of all sports now, not afraid to shake it up when it comes to starting this season with a new game plan, one they learned in the NBA bubble. When we come back, more about that. And it's a rematch between Lanier and Brackenridge for the district title, one of the big games coming up. San Antonio's first hit on their 2020 training camp today. And for the very first time, no media allowed into the COVID-19 pandemic. Instead, they made Greg Popovich available through Zoom this afternoon as he begins his 25th season as the head coach of the Spurs, coming off his first lottery pick since he selected Tim Duncan way back in 1997. It worked out pretty well for the Silver and Black five championships later. Now, let the rebuilding begin with a new game plan that was successfully inside the NBA bubble in Orlando that LaMarcus Aldridge has already started to adjust his game to small ball. You know, the bottom line, in, in all frankness, is uh, I, d I don't remember winning a championship last year. I don't, I don't remember being in the playoffs. So it's, it's time to make a change, play a different way, demand it, and move forward. So the growth that took place there uh, in, in some ways was unexpected, uh, but it happened. So we're just going to go forward from what we did there. And I think that uh, L.A. will have no problem uh, adjusting to how we play. Pop also made it a point to address his team regarding the coronavirus and how they must be so careful since there's no bubble for training camp.
In the wake of former Steel Star Caden Stern's decision to opt out of the rest of this season and next to enter into the 2021 NFL Draft, what about quarterback Sam Ellinger? Ellinger is a senior and has the option due to the NCAA COVID adjusted rules to return for next year as well. When asked if he's thought about opting out early, with still two games left to play in the regular season against Kansas State and Kansas, after his own offensive lineman Samuel Cosby also decided to do so. I haven't. Um, you know, I, I while I absolutely love and respect them, I I, I would never do that. Um, you know, I, I want to finish what I've started here, and um, want to. I will always give my all for my teammates. Um, and everybody's situation is different. I get that, um, but I, I wouldn't. Kickoff in Manhattan on Saturday is set for 11 a.m. The Vikings, Texas Aggies are 6-1, ranked fifth in the nation in the latest college football playoff poll that came out tonight, and they will face their toughest test this week when they travel to take on Auburn. The offense, and more specifically, quarterback Kellen Mond will have to perform much better in order to avoid an upset after only completing 32% of his passes with no touchdowns in the 20-7 win over LSU. He wasn't as sharp. He got hit some. And that's part of it. And you got to play, and he'll make adjustments and move on. And just like he has all year and always has in his career. But some of that, too, in his defense, he did not play a good game, had some mistakes. And like he normally does, he's, you know, he's been playing really, really good football. But we got to play some better around him, too, and some things and, and some plays, make some plays, protect him a little better at times, and do a better job. But yes. Expect him to come back and play really well. The Aggies are six and a half point favors. Kickoff against Auburn is at 11 a.m. Playoff volleyball. Who's moving on and who's out next? One of the big games and a big game coverage this Friday night will feature the Lanier Vokes against the Brackenridge Eagles to decide the district championship in 13-5A Division I. Forced to play a COVID-shortened season, the Vokes come into Friday night's game, leading Zone B in 13-5A Division I overall at 3-1 with a 3-0 record in Zone B, with their only loss to the Brackenridge Eagles two weeks ago in a close one, 21-14. While the Brackenridge Eagles are undefeated, 5-0 overall record, 4-0 in zone play, A, and in which also is a head coach Willie Hall's final year at Brack after 37 seasons, 25 as head coach. I know that they're going to come out and play hard just like they did uh, when we played them last. And I know that they don't got no quit in them either, so it's going to be a great game. They have a good team over there. They have good players, you know, good corners, good safeties, defense, offense. They have guys, they have athletes, you know, they have a good coach over there, you know, so. They're, they're a great team, but they're going to go against a great, against great team like us, too. Kick off in Alamo Stadium on Friday night, except for 7.30. Class 6A regional semifinals in volleyball this afternoon. Undefeated O'Connor taking on Reagan. Panthers looking to rally. Down two sets to one. Lexi Davila delivers with a spike. O'Connor jumps out to a 7-3 lead in the four, but the Rattlers respond first. Naya Anderson rips one right down the middle, 19-14 Reagan. Then on match point, Chichi Ozigbo. Adds the exclamation point. Reagan shots O'Connor. 3-1 to one, advances to the regional final. On the other side of the bracket, Brandeis taking on Harlan. Hawks up early in the first set. McKenzie Vernon blasted through the block and down. 11-10 to 10 Hawks. But the Broncos rally. Carly Ferris with some quick thinking goes to the far corner for the kill. Great vision there for a three-point lead. And then Ferris sets up her future TCU teammate Jalen Gibson with the spike. Broncos win in a sweep. They will face Reagan in the regional final on Saturday. And thanks to our own Andrew Seeley, you can go online now and hear some post-match interviews from both of those. Those look like some intense matches. Though. They were. Be- he said the crowds were electric tonight. I bet. Thank you, Greg. Oh, we've seen them grow their beards for a cause. How the No Shave November Challenge came to a strong finish. Coming up next on the Night Beat. Want to give you a quick update on the No Shave November campaign. The KSAT team off and on air was able to raise $9,702 for cancer prevention, research, and education. Thank you, viewers. The team has come in at number five out of all the teams in the U.S. When it comes to the organization category, KSAT came in number four. That includes the donations for the KSAT team of reporters and anchors. I always say... Our viewers are the best. Absolutely. Look at those videos. I have not checked out those videos online. I didn't I do it. Look at those. I'll look at, look at my. <laughs> did they do that on the I air? I love that. Good night. You look so